that cartography has a knowable theoretical core lying outside of mere handicraft virtuosity, and that understanding of this core is of real practical value has been central to my work for some time. In contrast to this, the great majority of map makers, whether or not they self-identify as scientists, hold the Confucian principle that cartography is something that, to be successful, need only be done correctly. And rightness for them is a purely procedural or mechanical adherence to some set of fundamentals. Such notions, however, are quite unsatisfactory as an explanation for cartography. Cartography is and must be an informed practice. And just as the unexamined life is not worth living, neither is the unexamined practice worth pursuing. Mastering an informed practice requires more than knowing its mythology. It requires an understanding of its ontology and its epistemology. That is to say what it is, how it is, and why it is. Furthermore, that understanding must stand up to scrutiny. That scrutiny should be carried out, as Bertram Russell told us, that not carelessly and dogmatically as we do in ordinary life, but critically after exploring all that makes such questions puzzling and after realizing all the vagueness and confusion that underlie our ordinary ideas. Now, the palpable nonsense that passes for foundational explanation in cartography is rife with vagueness and confusion. To say, for example, that maps tell stories is simply to say nothing at all. The nostrum flies in the face of everything we know about stories and about maps. It contributes absolutely nothing of practical value, and more seriously, it closes down beneficial consideration of the actual situation. Other examples can be cited, but the central issue is that if people are content with sham, unexamined, and bogus explanations, then real accounts of phenomenon will never be forthcoming. Now, I have for some years been scrutinizing cartography as a practice and in scrutinizing maps as meaning-bearing artifacts. I assert that this scrutiny is of general value both to the practice and to the artifacts. In discussing this activity today, I'd like to talk about how it happened that I came to this scrutineering, came to recognize it as a worthwhile endeavor, and came to adopt the approaches I've employed. I've only been making maps professionally for about half of my life. Throughout my life, however, I have been making a variety of various sorts of things. My father was an engineer. In the 1950s, he was an automotive engineer for Cadillac, where at 23 years of age, he was put in charge of the very first engineering computer at General Motors. In 1962, we moved to California, where he worked for IBM, assisting in the very first work in inventing computer drafting. It, by 1966, he had taken his Doctor of Science in Computer Science degree at MIT and went on to many other projects. Now, I'm not the brilliant, driven perfectionist that was my father, but I did inherit from him a certain methodical inquisitiveness. I had the grades and the merit scholarships to attend any university I fancied, but I chose Franconia College, a very small institute in the North Country of New Hampshire. The 1970s were the heyday of progressive alternative colleges, and Franconia was the most progressive, most alternative of them all. Noam Chomsky once remarked that those of you who have been through college knows that the education system is highly geared to rewarding conformity and obedience. Well, Franconia was different. Uh, I sometimes say that Franconia ruined me for other schools. and In reality, it allowed me to see through them. This is something that qualifies as a superpower. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, my work at Franconia centered on abstract expressionist painting and constructivist sculpture. Neither were by then cutting edge styles, but each had valuable lessons. Abstract expressionism concerns painting at its most visceral and immediate, paint on canvas. Every element has attributes of color, texture, shape, and arrangement, just like any painting, but it leaves aside illustration, depiction, narrative, and illusion. A painting is not a picture. It's a painting is about paint on canvas. Abstract expressionism was one of the pinnacles of high modernism, 
and is arguably a literal embodiment of Marcel Duchamp's idea that art is a series of gestures, choices, and chances in space. I also made sculpture. Sculptural relationships between masses, shapes, textures, and colors have to be established in three dimensions. With no front, side, or back, a work has to be approachable from any angle and to reward any engagement. Sculptures also inhabit the space, same space that we ourselves do. It was some good advice I had at Franconia that sent me next to NASCAD, the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in Halifax, and no place could have been better. NASCAD was at the time the most important art college in the Western Hemisphere, and I was there at its heyday. NASCAD was about conceptual art, and each and every decision about a work might potentially need defense. You had to know your art history, know your critical theory, know your craft, and above all, know why. You had to be able to speak about your work, to keep your feet, and to get up when you stumbled. In Halifax, I worked with William Tucker, the famous British sculptor and a student of Anthony Caro. The vast majority of you, I am sure, will never in your life meet a serious British sculptor. Such creatures are fully capable of thoroughly and methodically working out a minor issue of form over two or three decades. If Tucker taught me anything, it was that one creates sculpture against a horizon of sculpture. My sculpture was evolving dramatically as the focus came to center on the forms and workings of machinery. The work was moving past its influences and becoming its, my own. My final year at NASCAD, I learned of a graduate level institute in the Netherlands, the Jan van Eyck Academie in Maastricht, offered facilities, technical assistance, and other help to artists for one or two years, and English was the common language. Plus, at that time, Americans could work in the Netherlands without a permit. The Jan van Eyck exposed me to a tremendous range of new influences and brought home what was important about the things I thought I already knew about making difficult, obscure, complex work. This period was the peak of my engagement with that symbiotic relationship that exists between a vehicle and a driver traversing a landscape, and it continued my investigation of the nature of art. Art making is an activity existing at the nexus of concept, craft, and canon. The idea, the reason, the justification for the understanding must be sound and intrinsically valuable, and the result must be accessible to an audience. Upon encountering a work, someone has to be able to find that intr sound intrinsic value, or a reasonable facsimile thereof, by recognizing, accepting, and believing in the existence of that value. It is through the viewer that the work becomes art. To get from the idea uh, to art belong, begins with manufacturing the artifact. And this is the realm of craft. One can easily get lost in the practice of craft. Some people never get beyond it. And see craft virtuosity as subsuming both concept and canon. We admire the skill and the finish of such works, but if, but if we have any ba balance to our understanding, we also recognize its superficiality. In this regard, map making is exactly like arc making. This is why I've always understood my cartographic practice as identical to my art practice, because map making is, in fact, purely and simply an art practice. This would not be obvious to someone with an uninformed, unexamined understanding of either cartography or of art, but the symbiosis is central to both practices. Each practice has its own ontology and epistemology, its own paradigms, iconographies, and canonical horizons, but there's a correspondence between them. All maps, for example, are created against a horizon other, of other maps. Note that I'm not saying that maps are artworks. I'm not saying that, and I'm not saying that they're not. Pop art raised and answered such questions some decades ago. I'm instead discussing the correspondence that exists between the makings of various types of meaning-bearing artifacts. In 1984, I left Berlin, Germany, where I'd been living, and returned to Nova Scotia. There, I began a long period of intense focus on craft practice only lightly disguised by the need to support my growing family. I built wooden boats for a dozen years. Everything from lobster boats and yachts to 90-foot herring saners and scallop draggers. Believe you me, there is nothing that so focuses the mind on practical craftsmanship as wooden boat building. 
In the early, in the mid-1990s, as I'm sure you all vividly recall, the Atlantic cod stocks collapsed, taking with them most of the boat building jobs. It was quite clear that I could not fall back on my other career, raising llamas and ducks, and that things were looking pretty desperate. Serendipitously, however, I discovered that the very best practical cartography program in North America was located just across the province and that my unemployment insurance benefits would pay the fees. Thus, in the fall of 1993, I found my 36-year-old self in the cartography program at the College of Geographic Sciences, or COGS. By chance, 1993-95 was the exact tipping point in the transition between the traditional all-manual and photomechanical curriculum to the basically all-digital course it is to this day. COGS was a brutal experience. Fewer than half of my entering class made it through. And although I'm not likely, I am likely not the best draftsman ever to graduate, it is equally unlikely that anyone it is unlikely that, that anyone had ever been better prepared for that course than was I. Training there was laser focused on cartographic craft and everything else was considered irrelevant. There was a first semester course in cartographic theory. John Belbin thought, talked about gestalt and the golden section for a few weeks and that was it. No one there, least of all the COGS faculty, wanted to hear about my nascent ideas about cartography. In 1997, 20 years after first enrolling at NASCAD, I entered the Master of Fine Arts degree program in design and visual communication there, where I worked with the legendary German designer Hanno Isis. Hanno was a graduate of the Ulm School of Design, which was the post-war successor to the Bauhaus. Hanno is himself one of the leading early proponents of the late 20th century rediscovery of the rhetorical nature of design and visual communication. It was through Hanno that I came to understand the pivotal importance of rhetoric and of semiotics and thus found the keys to making sense of my scrutiny of cartography, what my scrutiny of cartography was bringing to light. My 1999 MFA thesis, Cartographic Design, Rhetoric, and Persuasion, was published in Cartographic Perspectives in 2002, and the great bulk of my subsequent writings have been seen there or heard here at NASIS. Uh, beginning from an evangelization of rhetoric as the ontological core of cartography, I've moved outwards to support the position by addressing epistemological issues such as the nature of the radical map, of map aesthetics, of map storytelling, and of other topics. The questions and ideas I brought forward challenge many of the shop-worn platitudes that too many of us repeat unthinkingly and instead point towards more reliable, useful, and nuanced understandings of foundational assumptions. I recognize that I stand on the shoulders of giants, and I have worked to select and curate from among the ideas of those who have come before me and of those around me. At the same time, I myself have impeccable and arguably unmatched credentials in art design and cartography, in semiotics and craftsmanship, and I've been able to add significant elements to the sum total of that understanding to synthesize cogent, understandable explanations of the theory and practice of cartography that are useful, usable, and persuasive. These ideas have, shown to, have been shown to withstand intellectual attack and should stand to the test of time. So I'd like to close these remarks with the, works, with the words of uh, Henry Louis Mencken, who wrote that his principal business was that of manufacturing platitudes for tomorrow, which is to say ideas so novel that they will be instantly rejected as insane and outrageous by all right-thinking people, and so apposite and sound that they will eventually conquer that invective opposition and force themselves into the traditional wisdom of our practice. The end. Thank you. Thank you. We do have time for questions. Mr. Street. So, at the beginning, you said something along the lines of the unexamined cartography is what? Is not a practice worth pursuing. The, the, un, the unexamined practice, yes.
it, uh, yeah, there are a lot of bad maps that are made. That, but and I'm, uh, I, and I'm not saying that there's not a lot of good uh, folk mapping or good folk art or anything like that. I'm, I'm trying to highlight the, the fact that the examination of it is, does have its, its values. To, to say that, uh, the same way that uh, Plato was, was perhaps denigrating all uh, people on, all people that have ever lived that were not especially Platonic philosophers, uh, that uh, you know we could you could be really doctrinaire in that I suppose but uh, I I think that in order to fully engage the practice it behooves one to actually engage it and to care about and to and to try to wrestle with the ideas about what it is that uh, this practice is actually going about you you can just go through life making pretty things and uh, you can be quite comfortable doing that and uh, make a good deal of money and maybe not making maps. But uh, the, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, this is, it is certainly a, uh, an argument about the, the quality of life in practice and the, uh, but it's not to say that uh, people don't do that and I'm not, so it, it is a, it is a, a, a Categorical statement that, but uh, I think that it's. I'm not saying that all the people that don't think about this should be shot or anything like that. That they should not be living. So uh, that if so, I'm I I won't be caught on the horns of, of your of your dichotomous. Uh, 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 dilemma there. Is that okay? For is that does that? Oh, I'm sure there's no. There will be no end to this. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, the uh, uh, certainly and, and much of what I'm uh, been trying to do, and again to to hark back to the the quotation from uh, Immanuel Kant on the second to the last page that I'm, I'm simply doing my best to not be misunderstood, to try to, uh, and I, I do that, I've been doing that over the years, trying to find different ways of making what I'm trying to say accessible and, uh, and believable and useful to uh, the, the various uh, people that I'm, I'm addressing. You don't you, you have to make maps addressed to your audience. You have to make all rhetorical arguments addressed to your audience. So I keep changing those, uh, those approaches and, and trying to, uh, to find different ways of, of actually making those, making those connections. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Oh, very good. Thank you very much. <laughs>